So uh, we will start the class today with uh, uh, Kubla Khan. Okay. Did you all read the poem once? Yes, sir. Did you like it? Yes, sir. Great. So uh, you know what? Uh, I thought of playing this uh, video for you and uh, it has nothing to do with the poem. Maybe it has a lot to do with the poem. We don't know. We will explore it. Um, I, you all seen this movie, uh, Beautiful Mind? Yeah, some of you. Okay. So, I am going to ask him to play that uh, the final climax scene, uh, which is the Nobel acceptance speech by John Nash. Okay. I see lots of connection between both the poems uh, in some way and it is a long legacy of history of genius if you like poetic genius or mathematic genius and so on. But let us see how, how and why there is a connection and let us spend the rest of the hour on teasing out the meaning. Okay? I've always believed in numbers and the equations and logics that lead to reason. But after a lifetime of such pursuits, I ask what truly is logic? Who decides reason? My quest has taken me through the physical, the metaphysical, the delusional, and back. Made the most important discovery of my career, the most important discovery of my life. It is only in the mysterious equations of love that any logical reasons can be found. I'm only here tonight because of you. You are the reason I am. You are all my reasons. like it, the video? Well, let me put it this way. I see connections, but do you also see connection between this poem that we are going to read and this video? Strangely? Remotely? What do you think? Soham? Yes, sir. So In what way, my dear? In hmm. everyday life. So, I think um, Kubla Khan is also a celebration of the, of the beyonds of reason that we perceive every day. Hmm. And in that sense, I find that they are connected. Fantastic. Anyone else wants to chip in? Uh, Ashwati, what do you think? No, sir. Okay. Others, please. Rashi. It is only under mysterious equations of love that ideological reasons are found. And I think it relates to Coleridge uh, a lot because even he had histories of love and then his histories of wanderings where we see his addiction to opium and his trance that we find in this world. Fantastic. So that is the point. Um, you know, uh, 
Actually, we have been doing this course for a while. Now, in some sense, uh, we have come to a point where um, we are able to see a long intellectual history. See, this movie uh, came 10, 15 years ago. What do you think? 10 years ago? 20. Yeah, yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, Kubla Khan, in some sense, 200 years ago. So, a, in a sense, when we do this connect, we do a connect uh, of a long tradition, uh, intellectual tradition or history from Coleridge to John Nash. We have, in some sense, want to understand reason as Rashi uh, identified it very clearly. Uh, in some sense, reason has its shades, you know. Reason is not 1 plus 1 is 2, come on, that is not how it, life works or even math does not work. If you ask a mathematician, what is 1 plus 1, maybe, if you ask a PhD in math, one, what is 1 plus 1, maybe that person may be thinking, Oh my God, he is getting me into a trap. Maybe he is talking about the prob problem of infinity, you know, that is why he is trapping me. Then he or she will think 50,000 times before answering because that is their domain and math involves lot of intuition. Uh, in John Nash's case, in the mysterious equations of love, he found reason and he points at his wife most gratefully and says, um, you are my reason. Well, you may call this a cinematic uh, melodrama, Tamil masala stuff, maybe, but what is more important is, he talks about his journey between the physical, that is the table, desk and all this math and all that um, uh, count things, geometrical shapes, uh, metaphysical, that which lies beyond this physical, such as intuition, emotion. Uh, irrational and uh, delusional that is belief, a strong belief in something that exists. And back, he says that is the foundation of his thought. You know what? Incidentally, this poem Kubla Khan comes under what people call mystery poems. It is good that Rashi pointed us uh, to mysterious equations of love and so on. Uh, this too, Kubla Khan too, uh, is under what called mystery poems, the other one being conversation poems. 18th century was an important century and is still an important century for, for us because it is 18th century when disciplines started getting bifurcate, bifurcated. Famous Western universities like Oxford and Cambridge and beyond, they started developing even Cambridge Royal Society of Sciences started recognizing specializations, chemistry, biochemistry, physics biology, anatomy, math and so on. Uh, that means, science was no more just a philosophy of nature, but a discipline in itself. Naturally, 
those who were in the creative field or even logic field or math field, they were uh, re reading a lot on science's discovery. Just as uh, we would in a general way know about genetics, they were knowing a lot about specializations and chemistry of the mind and chemistry of the body blood and so on. This was and Coleridge was not an exemption. You got me? So, he was uh, in some sense um, reading about addiction. Apart from being addicted, he tried opium a lot. Did you listen to that uh, lecture that I sent uh, about Nancy Anderson? Some of you, what do you, what do you, do you think, my dear? Was it uh, interesting? What was the reactions of? Uh, uh, and they were constantly playing Kubla Khan in the background, right? Who listened to it? Ashwati, did you? Yes, sir. Yeah. What 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 do you, what do you thought? How do you thought it was? What, what do you think? On creativity. I was trying to comprehend about how the context of him discussing Kupla Khan in the context of say reason or uh, disability or, or how we deal with our mind deals with reason. Yeah. Like and, kind of and creativity, right? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, so you, uh, how you associate creativity with say last classes we talked about uh, autistic genius mm. or, or those kinds of so, when I, I was trying to connect with a uh, disability class in particular, I was thinking about how we are going to discuss it in a context like this. Correct, correct. Very good. So, um, in the western world, from Coleridge to John Nash, um, they have a puzzle about what is creativity and where does creative creativity emerges in the first place in the in the indian side of matters which we will discuss in another class in indian scenario it is about aesthetics what sort of emotion re give rise to what of what sort of creative work for example karuna or compassion what does it give rise to, for example, or what kind of erotic love, what kind of literary forms it gives rise to. So, uh, Indian imagination about creativity is ab about all that, which we will not bother about at the moment. In the western world, they are always thinking about where does creativity come from? In the Nancy Anderson, uh, she you remember she cites the example of Coleridge having opium and uh, he gets a grand vision of Kubla Khan, more than 370 lines. Um, he has this grand idea of doing the rounds in the head and suddenly somebody knocks the door everything vanishes and then he ends up writing this 54 lines. Did you hear that part? So, um, well, is a legend. Uh, these are the myths doing around Kubla Khan. We, it may be true, it may not be true also. He wrote it in, some of it in his preface to the book. Yeah, the, um, yes, yes, that uh, his, uh, Correct. Um, some say he made it up. Um, he was reading a lot about opium, <laughs> reading a lot about uh, um, Mongolian Empire, tourist books, and so on. So he made it up as though he is a genius, just like that you write. But some say it could be true, but it can never be true. But what is true is this kind of discourse 
uh, around creativity that is what we should be concerned about okay so well don't try opium okay um, uh, it's quite um, in um, in canada i heard um, psychotropic drugs like opium marijuana they are all made legal now uh, for therapeutic usage or even slight amount of recreation but you know canada is an advanced world where uh, legal machinery and other things monitoring systems work well but in india we cannot afford that um, i don't think i also advocate uh, or support legalizing uh, psychotropic drugs okay so uh, um, it should be regularized and uh, its recreational use should also be monitored because it can potentially lead to devastating bodily and psychological conditions so uh, make no mistake coolridge suffered from immense pain opium withdrawal and opium addiction and several other conditions uh, the problem with this kind of discussion about creative genius in john nash's case you either attribute everything to his schizophrenia uh, oh yeah he was schizophrenic and therefore he was able to come with game theory in college's case you attribute everything to his um opium but that's basic nonsense um uh, nash could have done without schizophrenia he could have become a mathematical genius and contribution but we cannot otherwise also deny that he drew sustenance from intellectual sustenance from schizophrenia as much as um his work on math okay so we have to recognize that part okay having said that let's do some close reading of the poem um and then tease out what it has to do with disability studies or alternatively said in what way a disability studies framework enable a rich literary understanding of kubla khan very good can one of you read the poem aloud for the class so that we can take it forward what do you think ashwati do you want to do that yes. yeah all of us uh, should follow ashwati now in sanadu de kubla khan a stately pleasure dome decree where as the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea so twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled around and there were gardens bright with silver drills there blossomed many an incense bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills and folding sunny spots of greenery but oh the deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedarn cover a savage place as holy and enchanted as ever beneath a waning moon was haunted by women wailing for her demon lover and from the chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing a mighty fountain momently was forced amid whose swift half intermittent burst huge fragments vaulted like rebounding hail or chaffy grain beneath the thresher's flame and mid these dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river five miles meandering with amazing motion through wood and dale the sacred river ran then reached the caverns measureless to man and sank in tumult to a lifeless ocean 
And amid this tumult, Kubla heard from far ancestral voices prophesying war. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves, where it was heard the mingled measure from the fountain and the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. A dancer with a dulcimer in a vision once I saw. It was an Abyssinian maid, and on her dulcimer she played, singing of Mount Abora. Could I revive within me her symphony and song? To such a deep delight it would win me, that with music loud and long, I would build the dome in her, that sunny dome, those caves of ice, and all who heard should see them there, and all should cry, beware, beware. His flashing eyes, his floating hair, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he on honeydew hath, hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. And drunk the milk of paradise. Thank you. Okay, very good. So, let's, uh, let me read a few lines, uh, I mean line by line and do some close reading. Will you all follow with me? Are, are you all on mobile? Yeah. Okay. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man. In Xanadu did Kubla Khan a stately pleasure dome decree. See, um, it seems Coleridge was reading a lot about this Mongolian emperor Kubla Khan uh, who lived in 13th century. He had lots of uh, recourse to tourist notes, stories, fantasies and so on. In some sense, this poem takes away straight to an imaginative place called Xanadu. Uh, well, anglicized pronunciation, uh, that's all right. It seems that place like the biblical creation. Let there be light, and there was light, right? Uh, a similar process, it was, it was created by an act of decree. Do you see that? Decree. Decree is a formal um, word that usually associated with state. The decree of the emperor. The, it's an order. Let there be Xanadu, and there was it, Xanadu. That kind of a stately, again, a stately pleasure dome. Well, a dome full of pleasure inside. In, in some sense, an imaginative world where only pleasure can exist pleasure of all kinds, okay? maybe heaven, where even the milk of paradise, Amudam in Tamil, uh, elixir if you like, is there. Uh, after decree there is a colon, mind you, which means lots of things are going to follow, like what? where Alf, the sacred river Kama, ran through caverns measureless to man down to a sunless sea. Gosh, it's going to the bottom of everything, downless to a sunless sea. Bottom of the ocean, bottom of imagination, caverns, Bottom of the mind, caverns measureless to man, 
hitherto unforeseen place. Look at the structure. So, this is why people say, well, you, you, uh, Coleridge might have said he has written out of opium addiction or opium influence, but look at the formal structure a stately pleasure dome decree. A stately pleasure dome decree, iambic tetrameter. What is an I am? Very good. Short, long, short, long, short, long, that kind. Like an emperor walking with one left foot, he will keep a long right foot, one left foot on long right foot, tuck, tong, tuck, tong, like that. Why? It is, um, see, um, you have to understand this. See, we, we need to look at why this kind of a tradition emerged in the first place in the western world. It is a rhythm. Uh, if you see, if you can see, uh, western dances are usually couple dance, minuet from minuet to salsa. Good salsa dances here? Well, so um, and each, uh, for example, if you take a classical minuet, students of western music will know, it has to be carefully orchestrated when, when in a couple, when one couple is doing short long, short long rhythm, the other couple on the other side should be doing long short, long short, long short. So, that both meet face to face and they withdraw. Uh, it is a kind of a orchestration, but in um, the I am which uh, Rashi pointed us short long, it is also called rhyme royal, uh, an emperor's feet as it were, majestically walking. Tiger, tiger, burning bright, like tiger majestically walking. So, all this uh, romanticists grabbed this uh, I am, so that anything that has to do with majesty, Xanadu's empire, you use short long short long, a majestic feat, sound of a majestic feat as it were, you know. With a colon, stately pleasure dome decree, I am saying colon, you all listen, I am a title of the essay, I am the title of this empire, I am everything, let there be Xanadu and there was Xanadu with pleasure dome. Emperor, emperor says that with reasons might. There is no second opinion to emperor's reason. Okay. So, naturally, this guy got uh, thinks, I mean, this guy meaning Coleridge, uh, even during influence, opium. Let us assume he is influenced. Still this rhyme royal pattern, tetra meaning four, um, four I ams, a stately one, a short, short long, a stately pleasure, dome, decree. Uh, one word is not one syllable, it is it has to do with the sound. So, what happens? 
the first part of the story where Ryan Royal happens, the reasons, some kind of a pleasure dome is established. At this moment, we will, it's, it's quite too nice to make some distinctions. What is the distinction between imagination, fantasy, hallucination, delusion, fantasy, all that? Am I making sense? See, uh, let us walk one by one. Okay? Imagination. What is imagination? May I ask? Priya, are you here? Yeah, okay. Suma? Sridhar? Yeah, what is imagination, my dear? Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, it's very hard to, how can you define, suppose I ask somebody, what is head, then it's quite difficult to immediately say. Anyone wants to try? What is imagination? Very good, that's fine, because if you ask about a simple word like that, it's very hard. Let me try for you, okay? Imagination is seeing something which is not here. Does that make sense? For example, I am imagining maybe a dinner in Delhi, um, which is quite possible, but not happening at the moment, you know. Um, imagination also has to do with coming up with something which is not there. All entrepreneurial activities are imagination, meaning creating a new poetry. Before Coleridge, this poem did not exist, right? It is an act of imagination. Uh, all rational sciences need imagination to do new things, new formulaics, formulas, new objects, new things and so on. In which case, how it is different from other things? For example, hallucination. What is hallucination? So, um, hallucination can be defined as um, viewing something that is not exactly physically present to the viewer. Yes. So, there is some sense of uh, I mean agency in imagination, while hallucination, I think it's, it's just imagination not under our control. <laughs> <laughs> Sanjay, very good. Have you come? Very good. That is hallucination. Did you get frightened? <laughs> Some sense of coercion. So, I was actually able to see Sanjay, which you were not able to see, and then I was acting on that with, um, she said correctly, uh, agency, right? You said agency, no? Yes, your fuller agency is involved. Uh, the notorious Pokemon Go. Did you all play it? No. Good. My good. My students are good. Yeah. But they are lying. I know. Is that true, Ashwati? Okay. Pokemon Go. Whatever that means. Yeah. This Pokemon Go. I want to play. Maybe you can help me uh, to play it. See, there is a billion dollar industry which is emerging now. Apple is coming, going to come up with a virtual machine to tap into human tendency to want to hallucinate. 
indulge without being there in full sensory pleasure pleasure dome as it were so each, each apple mission is going to be a pleasure dome where you actually live in something which is not there in its fullest eros and completeness okay so that's hallucination so we saw imagination so in an act of imagination what happened xanadu emerged let there be xanadu and there was and what is going to happen there down uh, let me read the next stanza okay so twice five miles of fertile ground with walls and towers were girdled round and there were gardens bright with senvis rills where blossom many an incense bearing tree and here were forests ancient as the hills enfolding sunny spots of greenery ha full description of this xanadu it was surrounded by hills blossom forest sunny spots of forestry and so on but now comes the interesting part just think about hallucination and all that okay but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill toward a seed and cover exclamation mark a savage place as holy as as holy as an enchanted as here beneath a waning moon was haunted by woman's wailing for demon lover gosh see see look at look at all these things this guy now has created the pleasure dome by an act of decree from the kubla khan but within that xanadu it's not a kingdom king is not ruling by it is ruled by all acts of pleasure and creativity and one of the male fantasy okay is woman wailing for her female lover and from this chasm with ceaseless turmoil seething as if this earth in fast thick pants were breathing a mighty fountain momently was forced amid whose swift half intermitted burst huge fragments vaulted like a rebounding hail or chaffy green beneath the thrushes flail it's kind of is talking about in some sense orgasm of this woman wailing for lover orgasm of the earth spewing spitting throwing away swift half turn intermittent burst huge fragments what like rebouncing hail a chaffy green beneath the thrushes flame and amid the dancing rocks at once and ever it flung up momently the sacred river if like the poetic narrator the protagonist is already in that place um in some says witness to male fantasy in all its rich multisensory um overwhelming multisensory um deluge right from 
female moaning to earth heaving to winds to um, the gust and rapidity to of earth water fire sun everything very uh, geographical symbolism symbolism of human body especially the female body and meeting the fantasy of the male uh, who is into xanadu already so now that makes me ask the question what is fantasy uh, in some sense fantasy is about daydream it is about if you like freud as freud would put it it's a kind of a wish fulfillment uh, uh, the romantic ages imagination with female emotion female uh, female matters about sexuality to birthing to and their intrinsic difference from a man's reason or decree you are you are you are able to see it now and so on it goes let me also go but you see the meter has shifted now um uh, i was saying iambic pentameter tetrameter but now it has shifted to iambic pentameter what does it matter what's a big deal about shifting meter well it also suggests the chaotic orgasmic nature of xanadu's pleasure dome it's irrational it's beyond the degree it is sexualized it is a fantasy world and so on let me go on through wood and dale the sacred river ran then reached the caverns measureless to man it's talking about the sacred river now sacred again sacred is <coughs> sacred is beyond reason okay to me something is sacred that's it there's no question about it but the problem is what is sacred to me need not be sacred to you there should be tolerance our huge debates about um cow when other things uh, involve this kind of matters and sank into tumult to a lifeless ocean and mid this tumult kubla heard from far incensed ancestral voices professing war and shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingles measure from the fountain and the caves look at the size of the um, uh, lines now they have shrunk as though they were floating on water so different fantasies actually uh, one the fantasy one the which in the larger imagination xanadu then the pleasures of xanadu then as though this thing is floating on water it was a miracle of rare device a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice a damsel with a dulcimer in a vision once i saw look at this word vision it's about a poet 
did you see the shift in voice in a vision once i saw colon hereafter i am afraid it is going to be autobiography do you all agree in a vision once i saw until then until now it was irrationality fantasy imagination all in the shape of formal introduction formal rhyme patterns and so on but now on it is going to be about poet's own hallucination in a vision once i saw again it is the nature of poetic genius that we are talking about well some children have precocious vision they are able to see uh, numbers beyond their capacity at the age of 5 somebody may um, say shakespeare upside down if that is possible um uh, mozart was autistic they claim um, and so on what is the nature of the poetic vision here it was an abyssinian abyssinian maid and on her dus, dulcimer she played singing of mount abora could i revive within me her symphony and song to such a deep delight would win me that with music loud and long i would build that dome in air that sunny dome those caves of ice and all who heard should see them there and all should cry beware beware see again he is talking about one more creative process how suppose you hear one music most beautiful melody okay say a beautiful malayalam song or raga in a flute you go away it keeps ringing in your head you want to recreate the happiness that you had while listening to that flute how can you recreate you simply have to replay it in your head right but if you have to convey the happiness that you heard while listening to the flute on paper i am afraid that's going to be very difficult now we are coming to the heart of creative process creative process not only ima- involves imagination fantasy delusion it may also involve recreation doing the god's work she he heard the abyssinian maid i mean again all eastern references okay kubla khan mongol abyssinia again modern europe 18th century europe even now some fascination with the orient that orient being the safe place of the sacred the exotic the charming the magical the orgasmic the creative and the otherworldly alokika so he 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 wants to recreate that creative energy that this abyssinian maid had and then what happens if we could do that then it is equal to creating the pleasure dome that zanadu that kubla could create by a decree kubla had one command what is that he is a royal monarch okay 
he can create by the act of decree. But Coleridge, the poetic genius or the poet or the narrator of this poem has a different command, the art of recreation, the irrational power, the delusional and so on. So he can create or recreate a pleasure dome based on the song that he heard from the Abyssinian maid. Then if he could do that, what will happen? What will happen? The audience will say and all who heard should see them there. And all should cry, beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating air, weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread, for he, wa he on honey dew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. Look at this. When you actually realize that when the poet has actually can actually build a pleasure dome based on the music he heard, the vision he had, the fantasies, then you will look at him with dread, fear. Oh my God, he's such a poetic genius. He's so different. He's so exotic. He is mine, but so different. If you like artistic vanity, you know. And he is the one who drank the milk of paradise. That is, maybe messenger of creativity, uh, creative genius and so on. Right. In some sense, we have finished in some sense close reading the poem. What do you think about the poem? Did you like it? Confusing? What do you think? Ashwati? No idea. Sorry, sorry? Poetry class, University. Hmm. Took it for us. Okay. So this was again like a relations of revival. Yeah, so this the rendering was beautiful. Okay. But I was like all the time I was trying to think about what kind of genius is a genuine genius. Like I mean so say the drug influenced so I, maybe I'm deviating from the topic, but this one thing just got onto my mind. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm going to come to, to that now. Since we have finished uh, close reading, uh, maybe it is not such a bad idea to look at the connection. I can hear some voices. Uh, well, not hallucination, right? <laughs> mm. Mm not such a bad idea to see what the hell about disability and disability studies to do with this poem. Well, let me say all these things just as a winding up remark. Okay? So, in some sense we are in the second part of our uh, class dealing with the angle of disability about this poem. 18th century had uh, is a period where lots of travel was happening. Um, Imperial Britain was expanding, ships were going, lots of chaps came from exotic places like India, China, sp spoke about women, um, food, um, exotic lives, poverty. Um, nasty stench 
all that from that world. So all kinds of imagination was spreading. One of the things was about bodily deformity and the looks. Anything that has a new look created uh, or provoked poetic inspiration. For example, the rhyme of the ancient marina begins with an a, with a different looking man, somewhat east looking with a beard telling the story, long beard. So all the, you know, um, marriage party people coming close to him, enraptured, hypnotized, different look, the beware, beware, that kind of getting hypnotized by a different looking person. So, appearance and mutilations, the ill, the sick, the leper, the monster looking Frankenstein's monster, mind you, it was um, written at the same time. The gargantuan, the grotesque, they all invited attention and still they attend, uh, um, attract our attention. Okay? It is not as though it is lost. That is the first thing about. Uh, so, that is the source of creativity and engagement, artistic engagement with audience, which we do not have to forget. The second thing, Ashwati's obsession about hallucination and uh, the drug influence, well, that is equally important. Whether one uses for recreation or addiction or therapy, how does human mind works, how imagination works, how fantasy works, what is the role of madness in creating poetry? Looking, uh, looking at it, there are two, three ways of looking at it. Okay? The first way is to create, see madness as a source of creative genius. Tyagraja mad in love with Rama, uh, Bhakta Meera, uh, so Meera's uh, madness for Krishna, mystical poets, Aurobindo, very long Indian tradition. We have how madness is a source of bhakti, erotic love and other emotions. It is quite a huge tradition actually. Um, similarly, in the western world, um, drug induced or otherwise, mystical imagination to Imagine a larger picture beyond the mundane, in always involved madness. And this poem and the video that we showed, uh, viewed. Audience, directors, the cinema world and the poetic world, art world is directly and indirectly logged into this intrinsic connection between madness and creativity. The other way is, the second way is to took, look at this poem as total bakwas, call it nonsense. Yes, actually this poem is nonsense, all fragments and so on. If I were to write, I will be killed. Okay? I am sure I would not write like this. Um, 
So, fragmented, what is this? Yeah, first stanza, some pleasure dome, second, some rocks, uh, and third, some dulcimer music, fourth stanza. I give him, I will give him 1 out of 10 for the term paper. But that is the cool thing about it. Um, celebrate nonsense in literature. Nonsense, there is a, a, um, a tradition, tradition called nonsense literature actually. Um, it can invoke slapstick humor, it can invoke a pun on rational rationality, it can be a celebration of irrationality and so on. And third, okay, reclaiming madness, meaning suppose I am called a madman, I will say, okay, I am a madman, now I am writing, you listen. A whole autobiographical tradition by mad people reclaiming madness and they write a rich literature about it. Just finishing up, the last point is just about uh, you know uh, the influence or otherwise schizophrenia and uh, other things. Reductionism, this poem is uh, like this because of hallucination and so on. That is one way of seeing seeing at it. Broad way of seeing it at it is how our discourse of hallucination, schizophrenia, madness influence readership and a critical tradition. So, we have to uh, understand all these things. So, that is the in, in a nutshell uh, why this poem may be important for our disability studies course. That is all. Um, thank you. <laughs>